Justice P. M. Mukhi Memorial Lectures, which are sponsored by Professor Sunil Mukhi, who is a professor emeritus at ISER. Unfortunately, he couldn't be here today, but uh, usually he does give a small talk about his father, who was a, a high court judge in Bombay uh, during the emergency. Um, we've had eminent speakers like the current Chief Justice of India, uh, the Honorable Chandra Chun. Uh, we've had people like Pratap Bhanu Mehta speak in this series before. And it's my pleasure to have uh, with us today uh, somebody from Pune itself, Professor uh, Kalshikar, who has taught at the University of Pune for many years and still continues to uh, be very active, uh, publishing, I think, more actively than a lot of people who are actually teaching today. The difficult task, of course, is to condense an illustrious uh, uh, biodata into a couple of paragraphs, but we've tried to do that. Uh, Suhas Parshikar taught political science in Pune from 1978 to 2016. He is an honorary co-director of Lokniti, a research program on comparative democracy based at uh, CSDS in Delhi and also the chief editor of a biannual journal brought out by Six Sage called Studies in Indian Politics. He was associated with India's national election study since the 1996 elections and was one of the principal investigators of the International Project on Democracy in South Asia. He writes in English and in Marathi, uh, something that becomes increasingly rare nowadays, and has written extensively in academic publications, not just in popular media, and many of you no doubt have read his columns in the Indian Express. His latest books include The Last Fortress of Congress Dominance, Maharashtra Since the 1990s, which is co-authored with Rajeshwari Deshpande, published in 2021, uh, and another book edited with Siddharth Swaminathan in the same year called Politics and Society Between Elections. And of course, uh, there is, um, uh, you know, you will find a list of his publications online and it's very extensive. There are uh, several other earlier books uh, like Indian Democracy published by Oxford in 2017 and so on. Uh, so it's my great pleasure to invite him uh, to deliver the fifth annual Sunil Mukhi, I mean, sorry, uh, uh, Justice PM Mukhi lecture at ISER Pune. And uh, please, uh, Dr. Prashikar. Thank you. And I would also like to invite uh, Professor Vijay Thomas from ISER Pune uh, to acknowledge uh, Professor Panchikar's contributions with a little gift. Thank you. the embarrassment since Pushkar already mentioned some of the earlier speakers in this series. But nonetheless it is an honor uh, because uh, standing here in front of all of you uh, at the ISER and also speaking in the memory of Justice PM Mukhi is definitely an honor and I am thankful to Sunil Mukhi, the memorial committee and the ISER for having me here with you this evening. Uh, though as Pushkar explained, uh, Sunil is not uh, able to join us here. Now, I am sure that uh, you will communicate my sincere gratitude to him for inviting me here. Justice PM Mukhi was a judge of the Bombay High Court. In the tumultuous tumultuous period of the emergency of 1975-76 and many of the uh, younger scholars, students uh, here uh, really might not know much about this emergency 
but that was the first time when there was a direct assault on India's democracy by using the constitution itself. So the emergency was an assault on the constitution, but the irony of it was that it was using the constitution as an instrument of that assault. And one of the target of that assault, initially at least, was the judiciary, for reasons which I will be speaking uh, in due course. And unwittingly, Justice Mukhi was at the receiving end of this assault, uh, because then government, led by Indira Gandhi, decided to abruptly start the practice of transferring judges of the High Court from here and there to anywhere. Nowadays that is a common practice of course, the judiciary has accepted it now. But then it was something very new and he, Justice Mukhi, got into this crossfire and was abruptly transferred from Bombay High Court to the Calcutta High Court, which led also partly to the worsening of his cardiac situation and though his transfer order was subsequently withdrawn, he succumbed to the cardiac trouble without joining the Calcutta High Court. So such was the time that Justice Mukhi worked in the Bombay High Court that time. Therefore I thought that it would be a good thing to relate questions of constitution to what the courts do. There are of course other reasons why one should be looking at courts and constitution as both a symbiotic and also a tension ridden relationship. So thank you very much for being here for this memorial lecture and thanks to uh, the colleagues from the Humanities and Social Sciences Department uh, to, uh, for hosting me here, particularly for the last minute travel Pushkar to have the podium for the lecture. Uh, unfortunately, I haven't yet attained that level of meditative intelligence when one could speak without notes. So sorry for that. Uh, on 26th November next month, that is November, the constitution of India would be entering into the 75th year of its life. In these 75 years, though for a constitution 75 years is not a very long time, constitution of India has undergone many attacks, many appreciations, initially by foreigners, because when foreigners like Granville Austin were appreciating the constitution of India, many Indians were complaining and they still continue to complain about the colonial pedigree of this constitution, saying that this is not an Indian constitution. The other irony is that right now, when the constitution seems to be facing many a crisis, there seems to be emerging a very fantastic scholarship about what the Indian constitution stands for and how one can learn more and more from the constitution almost on a daily basis. One could, for example, list scholarly studies by scholars like Madhav Khosla, uh, Gautam Bhatia, whom I would be mentioning and drawing upon from uh, subsequently, uh, Abhinav Chandrachud, Anush Bhuvaniya. These studies, and they have all come in this period of roughly between 2015 and 2020, or maybe 2023 if you include Gautam Bhatia's latest book, Unseen Covers. These books have given us a better insight into what the constitution of India stands for or what really it means. Much earlier a book of the title The Living Constitution actually ascribed to the constitution of India a living persona, saying that a constitution is not just a document but something that lives on. And that life of the constitution happens through its interaction with politics, obviously, of the moment. That politics is mediated often by the judiciary, the constitution being a legally binding document for any society. A society's interface with the constitution often happens through what the courts do of the constitution. And that's why I thought it would be a good moment uh, 
the entry of the constitution of India into the 75th year of its life to look back and find out how these two, the constitution and the courts, have interacted with each other. And the word courts is in plural for a variety of reasons. Uh, one reason obviously is that there have always been different courts from the earlier one when the constitution faces a court. And that's why I will be talking about these 75 years of the journey of how the courts have looked upon the constitution. The other more direct and less academic reason is the court now ceases to be a court with C capital. There is what scholars call polyvocality to the judiciary. That is to say, the judiciary doesn't speak in a single voice. It didn't speak in a single voice earlier too, but at least it threw up a single voice as the dominant interpretation of the constitution. Whereas today, the polyvocality or the multiple languages in which the court speaks often results into what another critic has pointed out as speaking with a forked tongue rather than speaking in a straight tongue. So there is some kind of a problem with the way the courts today look at the constitution, the way in which they handle the constitution and the way in which they hand over the constitution to us, the citizens. That's why the courts are in plural here. Uh, I do not intend to go into many technicalities of legal cases etc. Nor am I competent enough to do that. I would be referring to a few cases nevertheless. But the main purpose of this presentation today evening is only to sort of present before you a large or broad view of these 75 years in which different ways in which the judiciary has looked upon the constitution and as a result of that the different ways in which rights and democracy have been shaped in our country. Uh, I would be speaking about rights more and maybe at the end I would touch upon the question of democracy as a larger issue. Broadly I would say that there are three phases in which the judiciary and the constitution have interfaced or interacted with each other. Uh, you must be knowing and this is common knowledge that when one sort of creates a typology, when one starts of talking of phases, there is always a kind of broadness to it uh, which violates nuances. You can always find exceptions to that phase that you are talking about. But I would still try to say that there are these three broad phases in which our courts have looked upon our constitution and handled the constitution. The first I would call a phase of literal reading of the constitution. And there is of course a long tradition in law and jurisprudence of judges reading a text verbatim and mainly restricting themselves to those words which are used and of course going back for their interpretations into who said what in the constituted assembly and etc. But the broad pattern is to look at the wording in the constitution and to stick to that wording rather than going beyond that or stopping before that. This is the period of 1950 to roughly 1973-74 first quarter of a century of the existence of the constitution. Uh, those who don't know about the constitution much, the constitution of India was written and signed by the members of the constituent assembly on 26th November 1949. Much of the constitution really started its commencement from that day itself, though ceremonially the constitution came into being on 26th January the next year, 1950. So, I am basically talking about this period from 1950 to 1973 as the first phase. This was also politically a phase of Congress's domination and at the same time 
the confrontation of the judiciary with the government and i am talking of the government because though technically legal experts would like to talk in terms of legislature versus the judiciary the debate was always with the executive less with the legislature the executive always stood for the legislature claimed powers on behalf of the legislature and said that no no we want supremacy of the parliament we want supremacy of the legislature legislature is elected you are not elected that was crudely speaking the argument which always ran the court rooms in those days so this is the first period when there was this confrontation between the government of the day making certain claims on on behalf of the uh, parliament the legislature and the judiciary reading the constitution and saying this is what the constitution says you can't go beyond that what was the issue obviously the issue was the issue of rights there is a chapter in the constitution on fundamental rights of citizens and as it so happens a government wants to read the rights in as restrictive a manner as possible the government of the day that time was also no exception two rights in particular or two clauses of the constitution were sort of at the center of this controversy one was article 19 which gives us our civil liberties or personal liberties including freedom of speech and indeed the issue was freedom of speech the other was article 31 the right to private property these were the two articles the right to private property was one of a clumsy compromises of the constituent assembly there were differences among members and some of a compromise was finally reached and this article was included as it then stood in the constitution so naturally it was a good ground for constitutional lawyers and the judiciary to fight over that is what happened many state governments started passing land reform acts and the government uh, sorry the judiciary promptly started striking them down saying that no you can't do it because people have right to private property reading literally the article article 31 the government said no no but this is a matter of policy we want to restrict this uh, land hold ownership for public good so how can a court come in the way the court said nothing doing article says this you can't do it that's one part of the controversy the other part of the controversy related to article 19 because the court started saying that you cannot limit freedom of speech which included freedom of the press also and these cases that i am talking about practically started the next day the constitution commenced so in 1950 itself you have cases immediately starting and the court saying you can't do this you can't do this you can't do that and the government getting irritated and saying how can you do that article 19 then sardar patel writes to nehru that we because nehru was not directly involved in the drafting of many of the articles but patel was so he says that then that is 2 years ago in 1948 47 we drafted these articles rather too idealistically and thus patel and nehru come to a consensus that article 19 needs to be curtailed patel was not so enthusiastic about curtailing article 31 but using the same logic nehru prevailed upon him and thus the first amendment came into being now you will find that this entire story happens within just 10 months or less of the constitution coming into being and in 1951 itself the first amendment takes place which a puts reasonable restrictions on freedom of speech and you know that reasonable restrictions in the hands of an executive always become unreasonable <laughs> and b it created a separate list or schedule to the constitution and said that any law that goes into that black box called the ninth schedule ninth schedule which goes into that ninth schedule 
is out of the purview of the judiciary. So a door was created, a partition was created, and the judiciary was told that anything goes inside that black box called the ninth schedule, you cannot scrutinize it. These were the two broad parts of that amendment. Why did this happen? As I said, in the first few months, the judiciary was reading these two articles so literally that, for example, a judge of the Bihar High Court, Sarju Prasad, in one of his rulings in a case called Shailwala Devi case, said that freedom of expression includes free speech inciting murder and violence. That's what the judge says in the ruling. He says that it is absolute. Even if I am inciting murder or violence, or in today's language, hate speech, I am perfectly within my rights because there is Article 19. So this is literal reading that the court was doing. Funnily enough, the very next day from the first amendment, the day the first amendment was made, the court said, that is fine. Because the first amendment said, A, there should be reasonable restrictions which the parliament will impose and the executive will uh, implement. And B, ninth schedule, land reform acts will go into the ninth schedule, the courts cannot examine those laws. These were broadly the two things. The response of the court, because there was immediately a challenge to the first amendment itself, in a case called Shankari Prasad, the court said, no, now the parliament has done this, it has amended the constitution, and as per the constitution as it now stands, the legislature can restrict freedom of speech and other personal liberties, or the legislature can put laws into the nine children out of the purview of the judiciary. So the first literal reading was between 1950 and 51. The second literal reading was the literal reading of Article, uh, amend, First Amendment. Then comes a shock in 1967. Because in 1951 the court had said, Parliament has amended the constitution, we are fine by it, we won't look into the legality of the amendment. That was what the court had said in 1951. 16 years later, in 1967, the court suddenly starts fighting back the government and the instrument again is a literal reading of the constitution. This time, and that is the ingenuity of the court, the court says that an amendment is after all a law because the parliament passes an amendment. Now, those of you who might have any limited understanding of legal lexicon would realize what is happening here. The government had played upon two different words in the constitution. One word is law in article 13 and the other word is amendment in article 368. So the government was playing upon that. Now the court started saying that after all an amendment is also a law because who makes that amendment? The parliament. What does the parliament do? The parliament legislates. That is what you have done in the case of an amendment. An amendment is a law and therefore we, that is the judiciary, will examine even amendments. That is the Golaknath case of 1967. Having said that, the court goes one step further and then says, therefore now we tell you that you cannot amend the constitution whichever way you like it. You can't do that. So again a literal reading. So between 1951 and 70, the entire battle between the government and the judiciary was fought upon the judiciary's claim that it was reading the constitution word by word, literally from the constitution itself. Though of course if you read the court rulings, you will find that a lot of legal nuances were brought in. So I am not saying that there were no other arguments made. Nor am I saying that the judges were ignorant because they of course had read the constituent assembly debates and quoted from those debates. But the final anchor, as one would look from the outside, is that judges are giving too much importance to the word, 
written and said or uttered word. The first departure from this happens in 1973 and that's why I restricted the first phase to 73. 1951 to 73 is then the first phase of the court legislature or executive relationship. What happens to rights? We will come to that in a minute again. But remember, just to quickly recapitulate, what is happening to rights? Actually, it is a very clumsy history. Initially, rights are being up upgraded. The court is protecting rights. Immediately then, the court is not protecting the rights and letting the government do whatever it likes. And finally, the court becomes so ultra-active in protecting the rights that a perfectly constitutional crisis emerges in 1967 because the government then retaliates by further amending the constitution saying that courts cannot look into amendments. So this ping-pong kind of politics between the judiciary and the government continues. The government hitting and the judiciary hitting back and the government hitting back again. It con this continues particularly between this notorious period of 1966-67 to 72-73. In 73 is yet another case known famously and which completed 50 years this year and that is one of the cases or the rulings of the Supreme Court of India which has stayed for half a century. So it is as good as part of the constitution. <coughs> That is the case called the Keshavananda Bharati case. Goraknath was in the backdrop of this case. In this case, the court seemingly stepped down one step and climbed two steps up. And you will realize why I am saying this. Because in this Keshavananda ruling, the court says that yes, of course, you can amend the constitution whichever way you like. But, there is a basic structure to the constitution and you cannot change that, that basic structure by way of amendment. Now, where is this basic structure? It is not written in the constitution anywhere. The court read into the constitution the idea of basic structure and thus inaugurated a phase of interpretative jurisprudence. So this is the second phase of interpretative jurisprudence that the court inaugurates in the Keshavan and Bharati case and again strangely enough even those judges who didn't ac accept the Keshavan and Bharati majority that is who didn't accept that there is basic structure later on used it to their advantage when they wanted to give certain rulings. Since then suddenly the relationship changes. Because now the court has said something very interesting. Seemingly, the court has conceded ground to the government, saying, yes, amendment power is the prerogative of the government. Then, the court hits back, and this is 7 to 6 majority, and there is a very clumsy history to this 76 majority. In some parts of the ruling, some judges from this side migrate to this side, and some judges from this side to the other. It's really a nightmare for even a scholar of uh, jurisprudence. So I'm just giving you the two larger picture. So the government court is saying, yes, you can amend the constitution, but we know that there is a basic structure to the constitution and the basic structure doctrine thus emerges, though, of course, in the Golaknath case also, the basic structure idea was already implicit. It was already there. Now the court theorizes it and says that you cannot violate that basic structure. Uh, An uh, unrelated story to this of course is naturally anyone, particularly if she is a student, would ask, so tell us what is the basic structure. And the court, probably rightly, said we won't tell you. <laughs> the court did this in rightly because the court was not there to write the constitution. Remember, in a sense, let us give credit to the court that it was not there to write the constitution. So it said, let cases arise, 
we will examine those cases and if we think that in this particular case any element of basic importance is involved we will tell you so what is basic structure the court said for example that democracy parliamentary democracy is basic structure you cannot amend the constitution in ways in which you would change the parliamentary system of democracy itself and to its own advantage the court soon later on said within 10 years of that that judicial independence is basic structure therefore you cannot encroach upon judicial independence but i will come to that in a minute because before that this is important that what the court was doing in 73 was opening for itself a space to interpret the constitution so one would expect that in this period there should be a greater space for rights and the space should also be greater for the courts to protect those rights keshavanand bharati ruling seemed to be doing that within 2 years of that the emergency that i spoke of at the beginning of the lecture came upon us the government imposed emergency and the government said that during emergency all rights are suspended including article 21 article 21 incidentally is the article that gives us the right to life and liberty so forget about liberty right to life was suspended and you can imagine what its meaning is many cases arose and finally all cases landed landed up in the supreme court and one of the blackest phase of india's constitutional history is this 1976 period when the supreme court actually accepted the government's argument that during emergency right to life and liberty to is suspended and the court raised its hand and said we can't do anything sorry and literally the attorney general's argument in the court was this that the government can shoot and there can be no questions that was the argument of the attorney general in the shivkan shukla case or adm jabalpur case and the supreme court in spite of the weapon that it had now got or the keshavanand bharati ruling basic structure sat quietly so no respite for rights in spite of keshavanand bharati at least in 1976 but the weapon was already created the weapon called basic structure of king and of course after the people defeated this government of 1976 in the elections of 1977 suddenly the court became brave and started using that weapon left and right <coughs> therefore instead of interpretative reading of the constitution i would rather prefer to read or title or name this second phase as compensatory courage <laughs> a phase where a lack of courage in 1976 by the supreme court of india was compensated for by a slew of cases later on which many scholars have also described as judicial populism some of you must have heard the term pil that is public interest litigations the court under justice bhagavati who later on became the chief justice of india also theorized on this idea of public interest litigation and thus opened the doors in the good sense of the term for ordinary citizens to go and ask for justice going without going into technicality is just one simple explanation of this what is at stake here you know usually in a court when you go and say that look that is something wrong happening there you have to prove that you have personally some standing in it which is in judicial parlance known as locus standi and the fundamental rule of judicial interpretation so far had been that unless a litigant had standing in a case i cannot go to the court and tell the court that look somebody else's rights are in danger you look into it no i couldn't do that 
no local standard. Now Justice Bhagwati theorized it by saying that this is part of judicial independence. We will decide what standing means. We will decide what procedures mean. And in fact, he said repeatedly in his rulings that procedures are of no importance if they don't serve the purpose of justice. <laughs> that is what Justice Bhagwati said and many of his colleagues on the Supreme Court subscribe to that view. This PIL therefore means that now under new dispensation of Justice Bhagavati, anyone could go to the court and say that the government is doing something wrong and I as a citizen have the right to come to you and ask you to set it right. So I may not be personally uh, adversely affected by that, but still as a citizen, I can come and ask the court to intervene. And since we are talking in the memory of Justice Mukhi, one of his other colleagues on the Bombay High Court actually should be given the credit for unknowingly theorizing this idea of public interest. He was much ahead of his time, in a sense. Uh, his name is Justice Gandhi. Justice Gandhi of the Bombay High Court, in fact, uh, gave this ruling in a politically controversial case from Maharashtra about the Back Bay Reclamation. You know, in Mumbai, the bay was filled in and land was created literally by the government under B.P. Naik when he was the chief minister. That is known as Back Bay Reclamation. And then this land was given without proper procedures to developers or builders as we call them today to erect buildings. No tendering, no transparency. So two political leaders, Pinu Modi of the Swatantra Party as it was then and Runal Gore, a politician from Mumbai of the Socialist Party they had gone to the Bombay High Court saying and arguing this that as citizens the government is doing something which is violating the basic principles of governance so you look into it and Justice Gandhi actually gives this ruling in 1976 actually saying this that it is the duty of the judiciary to look into the way in which the government uses its, its authority and sets aside the objection of the government that Piru Modi and Mrunal Gore don't have standing in the case. But later on, of course, Justice Bhagavati, and since he was a Supreme Court judge, it gets more traction and it becomes an important part of jurisprudence in India, expands the idea of public interest litigation. As a result of this, one of the best things that could have happened to the Indian constitution was the court starts looking at this same article, article 21, life and liberty in a new light and says that if somebody has the right to life, what is the meaning of right to life if you don't have the right to health, if you don't have the right to education, if you don't have the right to work in proper conditions. Thus the court, and this is not just one case, so I am not quoting any case, in a number of cases from Bhagavati's time to the late 90s, the court again and again invokes this idea and says that for right to life, you must have this, this, this and so on. The various famous cases of this entire period, like the MC Mehta case uh, about environment, the famous Vishakha case, about having uh, a proper mechanism for addressing uh, sexual harassment grievances and so on and so forth. The TMPOI case in which the right to education was seen as part of the right to life, all these are part of this. So in a sense golden period one would say as far as the right to life and liberty is concerned. As I said earlier, this had a flip side also, which is that the court uses this opportunity of this basic structure philosophy and takes away many powers to itself. If you look at these cases that I mentioned, 
the court was taking away powers of the executive, the policy maker, the government, the administrator, the legislature, everything. So, ideally speaking, this is something very complex that you cannot simply welcome or reject. Because in the separation of powers theory that we have adopted in India, the judiciary should only be an arbiter, arbitrator, not a policy maker. But the judiciary became the policy maker. And the fantastic thing that happened during this period was the judiciary, and since I was giving you the example of how to read the constitution, this is very instructive. In this period, the judiciary came up with cases that involved the question of appointment of judges. And the judiciary is always very sensitive about this. So it said, this is a matter of judicial independence. Judicial independence is a matter of basic structure. So we won't let you touch that. What was the issue? How to appoint judges? <coughs> judges of the High Court and the Supreme Court. There is a provision in the Constitution which says that government would appoint judges in consultation with the Chief Justice of India. But the court has now changed. Its habits of reading have changed. So it now starts saying that consultation means consent. Thus, within a few years time, the court starts a procedure through which practically the world over, the only court where it appoints itself. Nowhere in the world this happens. In certain political circumstances, we might feel a little happy that the government, after all, has no say in the appointment of judges. <laughs> but mind you that after all, the larger principle is that judges shouldn't appoint themselves either. Just as government shouldn't appoint the judges, the judges shouldn't appoint themselves. But that is what the judges said. And there were one, two, three cases involving this issue through which the current collegium system has come into being. So, my point is, A, by using the powers very liberally, the courts engaged themselves into a broad interpretative reading of the constitution. B, the courts expanded the scope of the idea of right to life. And C, the courts very astutely use this entire judicial technology to augment itself, to strengthen itself and insulate itself from the government of the day. That is what happens in this second phase. This phase goes on and on partly because it was convenient for the judiciary to have so much power. It goes on and on also because the politics outside was rather unstable. No clear majority governments existed. The Congress hegemony had been broken. As a result of which, the only bacon of any hope for citizens of India during this period was the judiciary. They thought that the judiciary is great. Let us pin our hopes on the judiciary. That is how the judiciary could do this and get away. This space continues. Gradually by the late 90s, early 2000s, some judges on the Supreme Court start rethinking about PIL. And that is partly also because anyone would go and file a PIL in the court. Uh, there has been a gross misuse of PIL mechanism by private corporates particularly. By early 2000s, therefore, the judiciary starts becoming cautious about this. And if you want to put a date to it, I would say that by 2010, this phase is over and we enter into a third phase, around 2009, 10, 11. And one of the reasons which I will tell you momentarily is the Chief Justice Ship of Justice Sarosh Kapadia, uh, during which time he sort of curtailed and discouraged the entire jurisprudence of PIL. So that's the third phase. So we can say that from 2010 to the present moment, we are into the third phase. How does one characterize this third phase? I will point out to the limitations of this third phase later, 
But to begin with, to give the benefit of the doubt to the judiciary, I would call it a phase of narrow reading of the constitution. You know, in jurisprudence, there is a term called reading down, which means that you read a particular provision or a ruling or a historical precedent, but de-emphasize it and thus reduce the substantive importance of that. This is known as reading down. So the provision is there. You don't deny it because it is there. But then in your ruling, you give less weightage to that particular provision and give weightage to some other factors. This is known as the technique of reading down as far as interpreting in the judicial context is concerned. So I would say, to be benevolent, that this is a period of reading down from 2010. Finally, if one starts looking at these last 13 years, you don't get a case like Keshavanand Bharati or Gulaknath to pinpoint the iconic character of that phase. There have been cases here and there. One could uh, maybe mention Navtesh Johar case, a case in which the Supreme Court decriminalized alternative sexuality. But it was no great contribution of the Supreme Court because the Delhi High Court under Justice A.P. Shah had actually already given that ruling and the Supreme Court in its wisdom had negated that ruling initially and then the Supreme Court says that now we are decriminalizing it. So nothing great, no new constitutional interpretation involved. The other case one could mention of this last 13 years of constitutional importance perhaps is the case involving the right to privacy where the Supreme Court says that right to privacy is part of right to life and liberty. Great. But if you read that ruling, you will find that it is much quantification rather than any substance. This case doesn't give you any new constitutional interpretation nor does it give you any specific satisfaction of having protected your privacy because despite the privacy ruling, at every alternate step in this country that you put on the land of this country, your privacy is legally violated. Aadhaar is one such example of this legal violation and the Supreme Court has practically clubbed in, in itself into a knot so much that while it has the credit of having said that there is right to privacy, it has practically done nothing to protect that right to privacy. And therefore, I wouldn't claim that in this third phase, we have any great constitutional interpretation as such. And that is, in a sense, symptomatic of a narrow reading or reading down. Because when you are reading down, then you run shy, you run away from any large picture or any large reading. You might agree or disagree with Golaknath, you might agree with or disagree with Keshavanan, but the fact remains, and you might agree or disagree with Justice Bhagavati on PIL philosophy, the fact remains that here is something that you would need to think about carefully to make your own personal opinion about it. In last 10 years, 13 years, the court hasn't done anything of that kind at all. Then why are we talking of this as a third phase for a very different reason? What has happened in these last 10 years instead is that the court has again and again got involved in or entangled in various executive actions and therefore the question is not what the court has done with respect to constitutional interpretation but what the court has done with respect to actual practice of rights. And the answer to that question is probably just nothing. The court in the last 13 years, because of its present tendency of reading down, has not done much in terms of rights because it keeps reading down. And therefore, once you start keeping reading down, you keep upholding what the government is doing. That is what the government, has, uh, the court has done in the last 13 years. Most influential perhaps has been the approach 
of Justice Khan Nilkar, who has now retired from the Supreme Court, Justice A.M. Khan Nilkar. Because in a number of cases, important cases, but in particular in an important case called Vatali 2019, W-A-T-A-L-I, this is the name of the person who filed the case. This is a 2019 case in which Khanvilkar judge says that the job of the court, and he was hearing a, obviously a bail petition, so he says that the job of the court is to consider the probabilities flowing from the reports of the police. Or looking at the material supplied by the police. In other words, there is an implicit faith in the executive that what the executive is arguing in the court and the material that the executive is presenting in the court is valid. So you just have to imagine what are the logical possibilities if this is true and if you think that these possibilities are grave, deny bail. That is what he did. And he was one of the influential, this was one of the influential approaches of the third phase, believing in the executive. In other words, the third phase is characterized by this belief in the executive. That is why Gautam Bhatia, whom I mentioned at the beginning as one of the most influential and very young uh, jurisprudential scholars, has stuck his neck out and called the executive court. He wouldn't agree simply by calling it a court that reads down. He says that it is an executive court. In a blog post, after retirement of Justice Khanvilkar, while assessing the contribution of Justice Khanvilkar, Bhatia has said that this is a court which promotes the idea of order over the idea of public good. This is a court where it is merciful to the state and merciless to the citizens. So the court, instead of becoming the guarantor of rights, because that is what basic structure of doctrine say, now becomes a guarantor of executive wisdom. Philosophically, there is always this clash between what the executive does and what citizens perceive. Citizens often look upon the executive or the government not as a repository of wisdom <coughs> but as a repository of power. Executive on the other hand looks upon itself as a repository of wisdom. That it has a monopoly of knowing what is in public good. So what happens is that the same idea of public interest that Justice Bhagavati and others used in the earlier phase to protect the citizens is now being employed because in all these rulings of Justice Kapuria, Justice Khanvilkar, in to a certain extent even Justice Deepak Mishra and others, you will find a recurrent theme that this is in public interest. What is in public interest? Refusing individual rights of certain citizens is in the public interest. So, it's a kind of 180 degrees of turnaround by the court using the same terminology but employing it for an entirely different purpose from what it was used originally in the 1970s, 80s, 90s. I will now come to the holistic question, which I left incomplete after the first phase. So what happens to the rights? Because after all, we are not interested in the intrigues of the Supreme Court of India, how judges of the Supreme Court of India give press conferences, etc. That could be a topic for a good novel. <laughs> what we are interested in is how the Supreme Court fares on this simple question of rights. The first phase, as I said, has a mixed record, but ultimately the result is that the Supreme Court surrenders and says the government would take care of rights. In the second phase, as I said, 
there is much advanced in, through uh, basic structure doctrine because the Supreme Court theoretically expands the idea of personal liberty and rights or the right to life. But this is very interesting that the Supreme Court is expanding and telling you all this when the government is also saying the same thing. So the Supreme Court is not actually confronting the government but speaking the language of the government itself. For those of you who might have studied or might be studying the Indian constitution, there are two chapters in the constitution. One, as I mentioned earlier, fundamental rights. Next is a chapter called directive principles of state policy. Rights are binding on the state. Directive principles, as the term suggests, are directives. The government from the time of Indira Gandhi had been saying that we must give precedence, we must give more importance to directive principles rather than rights. And what is Justice Bhagwati's quote saying in the 1980s? It is also saying that directive principles are more important. If you read all those rulings, you will find that there is a constant recourse to chapter 4 uh, of the constitution of directive principles when the court says that here are your directive principles, do this, do this, do this, do this. So, the language of the judiciary is no different from the language of the then government. No wonder then that the language of today's judiciary is no different from the language of today's government. If today's government thinks that order, that is law and order, is more important than anything else, the judiciary too sings in the same tune. So, in terms of consolidation of this idea of rights, there doesn't seem to be much accrual, much addition in these two phases. The other criticism that I would have of the second phase is that it goes on into a very traditional and cliché dichotomy which some of you might have studied, uh, you must be teaching it in the class, namely, negative freedoms and positive freedoms. Which then means that you look upon fundamental rights as something only negative freedom, that the state shall not do this, 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 this. And directive principles as something enabling the state to do something, something, something. This is a very convenient dichotomization because it allows the government to reduce the importance of personal liberties in the name of good policies for the people. That is what governments always like to do. They want to disprivilege or bring down the role of personal liberties as if, theoretically speaking, there is a tension between the two. And that is an old theory of Isaiah Berlin and John Stuart Mill and so on and so forth of negative and positive freedoms. So much so that some people would even go to the extent of saying that rights belong to the liberal tradition and elections belong and therefore electoral mandate belongs to the democratic tradition. This dichotomization between liberal and democratic is also a flawed dichotomization because unless you have free citizens, you cannot have a free democratic politics. Unless you have citizens who can robustly criticize the government, you cannot have a responsible government. Unless you have citizens who can fearlessly ask questions, you cannot have an accountable government and therefore Democracy would just not exist without the idea of rights. And here I refer to specifically individual rights. Because unless you strengthen the individual, there cannot be a free society. So there is something wrong in our thinking right from the second phase of this constitution court's interface, where we started believing that rights somehow are 
a few elite people's fancy idea that they want freedom of expression to watch pornography. The real idea of a good government is that government which provides you free ration. This is a crude dichotomization which is definitely non-democratic. The courts in their enthusiasm during the second phase of upholding the idea of a government that does good to the citizens unwittingly fell into the trap of reducing the importance of rights or individual liberties <coughs> as they are understood. Building on that or going down because it's a slippery slope in the third phase the courts have stopped thinking about rights as a valuable gift of the constitution necessary for democracy. Let me then conclude. We are not here to argue jurisprudentially what the courts have been doing. We are not here to evaluate the Supreme Court of India. Time will decide that. Our concern is, after all, what is this document that we started with doing here in India called the Constitution of India? Because that's the core concern. What does the Constitution of India do? If you read the Constitution of India carefully, with your heart in the right place and your brain in the right place too, the only unmistakable conclusion that you can draw is that the Constitution of India is seen historically and worldwide as an important document because it wants to do, and that is an ambitious thing, it wants to do two things simultaneously. One, it wants to protect citizens from the state as an institution, from the government, the judiciary itself, from the executive, from the legislature and what not. So, this is one thing that the constitution wants to do, does actually, to protect citizens from the state. Yet at the same time, the constitution wants the state to use its powers for a certain public purpose. And therefore, there are enabling instruments that the constitution gives. And this is something very complicated. There is a tension between the two. The constitution must have been aware of that tension and felt that democratic politics would somehow overcome that tension or at least negotiate that tension. But look at these two things. One, <coughs> that I am protected from the state. And two, at the same time, I am assured that the state will do something for me. That is what the constitution does. That is actually the real challenge that the constitution in a sense throws at us as citizens of the country. That look, this is the challenge, can you do it? Going back to Gautam Bhatia therefore once and finally again. He sums it up really beautifully when he says, and that is nothing new really, but because he is a constitutional lawyer, I am quoting him. Otherwise, you would have said that I am indulging in poetry. That the constitution has these three goals. And what Gautam Bhatia mentions are not goals which he has discovered. They are there in the constitution. They were the goals that Dr. Ambedkar fought for right from the 1930s and then claimed that these are the goals that the Buddha has taught me and these are also the goals that Jawaharlal Nehru remembered and said that these are the goals that we should learn from the French Revolution. <coughs> Equality, liberty and fraternity. You, look, you see, if you look at carefully what is happening here is three things. The constitution says that whenever there is a question of procedures, rule of law is the basis. You can't transcend rule of law. However great A or B may be, there must be rule of law and not that great person. Second, whenever there is a question of meaning, what should guide us when we are looking and reading the constitution, it is the question 
which is answered by the duo of equality and liberty. Again, in political philosophy traditionally, there has been a misconstrued dichotomization between equality and liberty. The constitution bypasses that altogether and constructs a unit of these two, equality and liberty. And finally, if there is a question of substance, what is this constitution for? What is this provision for? What is this nation for? What is this democracy for? The answer is fraternity. This is the architecture conceptually of the constitution of India that the courts from time to time through their minority rulings again and again have invoked. Very few majority rulings of the courts have upfront invoked this constitutional architecture as a result of which we now enter into the third phase and live in the third phase where there is a stark challenge. The challenge is not just a question of rights but the challenge is how do we or what do we do with this constitution. As the constitution enters into the 75th year of its existence, it could be simply a document written in 1949, read by judges and legislators and lawyers and as amended from time to time as they say in constitutional law. Or the constitution read in this tradition of the scholars that I mentioned earlier also, starting with Granville Austin of course and Ernest Barker and so on, but basically these scholars that I mentioned is a document that throws a challenge to its courts, to its governments and to its people to make a meaning out of it. You can make a sub-democratic meaning out of the constitution as the current Supreme Court seems to be doing from time to time. You can make a more ambitious reading out of it as the constitution might have expected us to do. That's up to us, that's up to scholars, that's up to lawyers, that's up to judges, that's up to rulers. Thank you very much.